Good evening. Um, I'm uh, so honored uh, and humbled to be up here. When I looked at the other honorees, I was like, I need about 20 more years, and maybe you could have called me back. So I'm uh, truly um, blessed to be here. And so fitting that this uh, event is here in Brooklyn. I am a diehard born and raised Brooklyn, New York. I uh, stand here before you unapologetically Muslim. And I am also unapologetically radical, and I want to thank my brothers uh, from the Peace Poets, who are friends of mine and people who are at the forefront of the movements that I'm a part of, for helping us reclaim this language. Um, the word radical has been used to criminalize political activists and communities, uh, as you know, uh, I would say for a very long time, but we are seeing an, uh, an uptick in that in the recent uh, movement work that we've been doing. Uh, for me, um, and the work that I do, I've made a very conscious decision uh, to not allow anyone, not the media, the pundits, government, or the right wing, to define who my communities are. I've also made a conscious decision to define Arab Americans and Muslim Americans not by what we're not, by who we are as communities. Some members of our community, including in the Muslim community, trace themselves back to the slave trade and my community is one-third African-American. Some are immigrants and have come on different waves of immigration, seeking a better life for them and their families. Some are refugees, and they're fleeing torture and violence and war. They thought they were gonna come here to the United States and be embraced by our country that says we were built and founded by immigrants to find a land that says we don't want you here or maybe we'll take you if you're a Christian. I have, worked, uh, have approached my work through uh, a quote that I have up in my office, and that reminds me every single day of why I do this work and how I do this work and who I do this work with. And it's a quote by an Aboriginal woman named Leela Watson. And it says, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because you believe that your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. I've had the privilege of working on many campaigns here in New York City, uh, including uh, some campaigns where we won. And winning is not something that happens um, in the communities that we come from, in black communities, Latino communities, immigrant communities, Muslim communities. Um, I was very proud to be a public school, or product of New York City public school, and a parent of three public school students here in New York City, and to stand with Mayor de Blasio to announce, after a long nine-year battle under the Bloomberg administration, to incorporate Muslim holidays into the New York City public school system. That campaign wasn't about um, religion or about uh, us you know, asking the New York City public school system for any type of favors. It was a campaign that was based on recognition, inclusion, and respect of New York City Muslim communities who one of every eight public school, public school students are Muslim. And it opened the way for our sisters and brothers in the Asian American communities to follow right after us and be able to incorporate Lunar New Year into the New York City public school system to reflect the diversity and the beauty of who we really are as New York City. I've had the privilege of working on passing landmark police reform legislation um, actually under the Bloomberg administration called the Community Safety Act to continue to rein in uh, the New York Police Department and their discriminatory police practices that they use against many communities of color. We were able to pass the Community Safety Act, which created the first ever Inspector General and independent oversight over the New York Police Department, the largest police force in the country, 37,000 strong that did not have independent oversight. For God's sakes, the New York City Parks and Recreation, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Education had independent oversight, but our police department didn't. So now they do. Not to say that that solved all the problems, we can get to that in a second. And we also were able to expand the protected categories under our anti-profiling um, legislation. Believe it or not, national origin and religion were not protected categories. Housing status 
uh, was not a protected category. And as you know, uh, from recent stories of the targeting of homeless people in New York City, so we were, I was very proud to be a part of that campaign and march um, in New York City with uh, uh, many activists, including the peace poets um, and elders like the Reverend Al Sharpton and others. Um, I was proud to be part of the New York City ID uh, campaign, ID NYC. Make sure you all have one. Um, this was a, an opportunity to say that uh, everybody in New York City is, uh, it should be proud to say that they are from New York City and they should all be able to walk around with an ID that gives them access to public schools, access uh, to government agencies that nobody should be turned away just because they are undocumented. Um, you know, the Reverend Al Sharpton said some very important things today, um, and I want to say that this work is not luxurious. Um, oftentimes people see us in the media and they think that we have some luxurious lives. Um, some of us are people who have police uh, uh, escorts in front of their homes at night because we get death threats. Um, we are people who are still trying to figure out how to live in, in the city that I was born in, in a place that's where there's gentrification, where we barely can afford to, to live. Um, I also compete with the Reverend Al Sharpton for headlines and tabloids and papers like the New York Post. When he's in it one week, I'm, I'm the week after, I'm always on page seven. <laughs> and I think these tactics are to Im intimidate people who have the uh, audacity uh, to stand up for our communities and other communities for us to say that we are not asking for any rights, we're asking for the God-given rights that we all deserve. I. I believe that the campaigns that I've worked on, the allies that I have um, cultivated in New York City over the years, um, anywhere, I'm from Bay Ridge, but anywhere from Staten Island to the Bronx, to Queens, to Brooklyn, being able to build power amongst communities of color because I believe that the power lies in the people and I've been able to, to see what it looks like when we build power and when we build power and we stand together, we win, sisters and brothers, and I've seen it happen many times before. I'm gonna end by, uh, Reverend Al was trying to steal this quote, but he kind of appropriated a different way. Like, like I'm going to bring it back to where it started. Um, he talked about, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you want people to be like, oh, no. Uh, the quote actually is about women. And it says, be the kind of woman that when your feet hit the floor in the morning, the devil says, oh, crap, she's up. So I want to thank you all um, in this room this evening for this award, for giving um, my community um, a platform here, a community that continues to be uh, misunderstood, unresearched. Um, I don't know if you know, but Arab Americans in particular are considered to be white by the U.S. Census. And just a quick story before I get off the stage, um, in the 2010, the US Census Bureau came to my organization, the Arab American Association, and said, we wanna help you, we wanna sponsor you, we want you to be a partner in helping to fill out the census form. I said, look, I'm down as long as you let, it, let me do it my way. They didn't know what my way was, so they just gave me the money and walked away. So we started a national campaign called Check It Right, You Ain't White. And we actually uh, provided some instructions on, uh, as, as part of that campaign. And we said, you know, check other. And we gave people examples of what kind of things they can put. For example, Yemeni, Egyptian American, North African, whatever it is they wanted to put, however they felt they can identify themselves. So what we learned later on is that if you do put other, you're still, putting in the, you're still put back in the white box, but it just requires a little bit more work on the US Census part. So what ends up happening is that after, for many years, um, elders in my community have been trying to get a new category in the census. Most recently in 2015, the US Census has been testing a new category called MENA, Middle East, North Africa. So in the 2020 census, you will see a new category called MENA that is going to allow my community to identify by region of the world that they uh, connect their ancestry to. Uh, not that I have a problem with being white, I just say if I'm not gonna be treated like I'm white, then I'm not gonna be white. <laughs> so, this, this question um, of race is a very important one to our communities and it continues uh, to be a part of the work that we do as we talk about Muslim American communities who have become a racialized community, right? When we represent every racial group ever, but we are still all one thing according to some people running for president of the United States, according to the media, we're all just one thing. So 
Uh, thank you to uh, McSilver Institute, to Silver, to the New York University for this honor. I'm very truly humbled and honored, especially to be, on, to be with these stellar people uh, that were honored here today. Um, and uh, my gratitude uh, to all of you and to all the organizers this evening.